welcome back to another episode of Sports Nutrition Education Network. Um, and today we have uh, Liam Holmes with us. Uh, so thanks, Liam. Um, I I don't even, I don't even know how to introduce you. Actually, you're kind of you're across two things at the moment, or multiple things at the moment, right? So I am I am indeed. Yeah, I am indeed. I'm a bit in, in a bit of a transition, which I'm sure we'll get into. Yeah. So I mean, get, should we should we dive straight into that? Do you want to tell us a little bit about what you have been doing and and where you're going, and then we'll kind of maybe go back to the start of PH and then. Move yeah, on absolutely. From there. Yeah, I think that's a good starting point. So I have been running a nutrition coaching company called PH Nutrition uh, for going on eight years now, uh, but I'm actually closing this down and moving into full time employment with a company called March On, and this is to be the head of nutrition um, and kind of focusing on the supplementation side of things, developing supplements, which which we'll dive into why that's such a, you know, keen interest of mine, but also just helping provide you know, nutrition education, uh, nutrition advice, uh, guidance, support across the whole uh, ecosystem that is March on. So the online programming, the gyms, the coaches, you know, people that uh, event days, stuff like this. So it's a pretty diverse role, uh, something that I'm super excited about. And yeah, as we'll, as we'll kind of go into it, like, you know, it's, it's the right next step for me in, in my career. And, um, yeah, you caught me right in the middle of the transition. So it's going to be, uh, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully a good chat in terms of providing people with a bit of advice and guidance, because I do think that, especially when I was an undergrad and even to an, to, to an extent, you know, doing my masters that having access or free access to people that had been there and done it and, and can provide a little bit of guidance and advice and just listen to the stories would have been invaluable so hopefully yeah. people can take something away from this today no, definitely so should, we, should we go into that that story then so i mean you mentioned your undergrad and your, your postgrad hmm. how did what did you do as your next steps to get you into this your own company and, and kind of give us a bit of an inf insight into that space if you don't mind yeah, I'll, I'll revert. I'll go right back because I didn't actually do nutrition as my undergrad. I did sports. Th I did sports therapy, and mainly because I wanted to be a physio and wanted to get into elite sport. As I think, which maybe we'll talk about, is maybe a goal for a lot of people. Um, and it wasn't like a be on an end all, but I thought I might as well give it a go. So I did sports therapy at my undergrad for three years, and it was in my third year that we had to do work experience and show my age a little bit I actually didn't want to do the local hospitals or the local uh, sports clubs that the the university provide us with in terms of work experience so I sent letters yes letters not emails oh, not, not, not not dms <laughs> letters <laughs> to every single uh football club in London from the Premier League all the way down to um the conference so asked for 50 hours work experience and then Luckily, I got Fulham. Fulham emailed me back. Uh, sorry, uh, message uh, uh, sent me a letter back and invited me down. I did 50 hours down there. I was thrown right in at the deep end with the first team, which was I could not believe, you know, my luck. And it really just snowballed from there. Like I was very willing to go down the the ladder in terms of conference, in terms of the, you know the lower leagues. But uh, it it was a yeah an opportunity that really kind of just kick-started me in terms of getting in and around that environment. Now, I I ended up basically my third year, I was working, you know, endless hours down there, traveling down, doing whatever they wanted me to. Um, and it was mainly kind of massage, just physio stuff, general kind of support. And then when I left uni, they offered me a, a, a pretty much a full-time job um, because one of the guys left and I did a little bit of stuff on the side, but it just snowballed straight into that. It was at Fulham. I did my MSc in exercise and nutrition science. Uh, after about four years and um, so I did that at the University of Chester and um, then qualified and again luck would have it the guy that was running the nutrition program back then there wasn't too much nutrition yeah. kind of support for, for a lot of clubs so there was only one other full-time nutritionist in the whole of the Premier League um, at that point and was that at Tottenham that was at Fulham oh so, at Fulham yeah at Fulham this was uh, I, I'm so bad with years I don't know 2000, <laughs> 2000 and 2011 oh, wow. 11 or something like this 2012 and um there wasn't very much support but the guy that was doing it was an snc guy and i learned a lot off of him uh it was where we developed a supplementation um in-house supplementation which really keenly piqued my interest in that but he left he he, he went to, into private practice and then my boss was basically like look do you want to run the nutrition program we'll do a probation period for two three months 
Um, and I just threw myself into it and the rest mm -hmm. is history. And that's when I started running the, the nutrition program for Fulham, very, very under experienced. And, uh, but yeah, it was one of them. I just, I just, you know, tried to do the best I could, best I could, but then it just snowballed from there. I went to Tottenham after that for three years. I went, um, that was kind of at that point where I'd been in football for a long time. That was after Tottenham, I'd been in 11 years and, um, it's, it, it, it was something that I was looking to maybe transition out of full time. So I started to get into CrossFit and that's when I set up PH Nutrition kind of alongside Spurs and my progression at Spurs was a little bit stunted. They had a head of nutrition guy there, a consultant He used to come in a couple of times a week, a really lovely guy called Matt Lovell, who was oh. super successful across you know, England rugby. So I worked under him, learned tons off of him, but um, yeah, my, my progression there was, yeah, a little bit, uh, well, I couldn't see how I was going to progress within the company. So the the uh, setting up my own business was something that was a little bit more attractive to me to give me a bit more flexibility in terms of my work. So yeah, PH Nutrition was formed and I spent a lot of time kind of building it in the, you know, in the CrossFit space originally. And then, and then it kind of snowballed from there. I, I stayed in football working for FC Copenhagen, Republic of Ireland, uh, and then most recently Celtic. Um, which uh, again, recently, recently given up. So my, my yeah. background is always been in football. Um, and, but then the pH nutrition side of things, as we'll get into is more general population. Yes. We've worked with some elite athletes. I mean, similar to you, Sinead, like, you know, the athlete side of things is probably something that's very, very small. And maybe often yeah. people think that that's going to be, you know, the be on and end or, and like, oh, if I get a few athletes, that's it. Or is that <laughs> in reality? <laughs> It really isn't like the, yeah. general, the general population was 95% of my business and we started with CrossFit and then just expanded into general nutrition, you know, different sports. Um, and, uh, and yeah, but that, that's the kind of whistle stop tour of, of, you know, how I've ended up here. And the next step is like I say is March on. Oh, well, I will, um, well, traveled individual then going up to, <laughs> to Scotland for the Celtic role, I guess. Yeah, I did it for 18 months and I would have continued it. But the, like you said, the job offer with March was too good to kind of turn yeah. down. And I'd been in sport for now a long time. Like it was, you know, I've got a young family. It, it became a little bit more challenging to kind of do. But incredible experience, you know, fantastic clubs that I've been very, very lucky to be involved with. You know, worked for Copenhagen for four years um, and it was it was amazing. Like, the, you know, this seeing different cultures, seeing different um ways of working within, you know, different countries with different teams, you know, different, uh, you know, practitioners is definitely one of the biggest things that I could probably say that shaped me in terms of a practitioner. Like you got to be, mm. you got to be putting yourself out there. You got to be having as many conversations as you can. You got to be putting yourself in, you know, in situations where you're going to be able to learn off of people. Um, we had an incredible, incredible staff at Fulham with some of the best people, the most knowledgeable people I've ever met. A guy called Mark Taylor, who who used to run a lot of the stuff at Bolton when they were doing really, really well. He was my boss. Mm -hmm. And a guy called Dave Cosgrave, who went to Copenhagen, is now in, in he's actually in uh, Miami, running the football right. like, performance director over there. These guys were just like incredible for me because... I was super young. I didn't know what I was doing and they just, you know, really pushed you in terms of that. So if you can really make it a point to just, especially when you're first starting out or, you know, even if you're starting a business, the best thing you can do is have as many conversations as you can, ask as many questions as you can, put yourself in the arena as much as possible rather than, I don't know, thinking that you need to be creating con content on Canva and putting it out there. Like, <laughs> get out there when you're when you're at, when you're in the uh, you know early stages of whatever whatever area you want to go in whether it's your own business whether that's sport whether that's general population whatever it is you just got to put yourself out there and I, def I do think that that's maybe something that i don't know you maybe can give me a bit of insight into that maybe people don't do as much these days and think that it's all online and trying to, to create the content you know get likes and get, yeah you know saves and go viral but it's it's still a, a necessary part especially in the early part of, of growing your business or growing your you know yourself as a practitioner i think you've identified yeah. really nicely sorry Sinead, the, the, and it kind of carries over with what we discussed a few weeks back about uh the variation the variety and diversity that sports nutrition and nutrition offers and 
and you kind of celebrated that in all that the different kind of roles even though within football you mentioned quite clearly that different people different cultures different environments enables you to I mean you don't get that in many jobs where you have that much day-to-day differences um and I guess that's something that needs to be to be celebrated and I think I like the point you made there with regards to just talking to people because then there seems to be a shift towards people really clinging on to individuals like and needing it like a like a solid mentor if you like have to I have to have a mentor when actually mm. sometimes it's just having lots of conversations I'm not not pushing away the idea that mentors are important of course they are but actually sometimes it's just having that diversity of conversations to enable you to to kind of think outside the box or to be able to take on a board other people's opinions and, and approaches because by no means is anyone you know the perfect nutritionist in this space or yeah. uh, no one's got the, the the you know all the answers because otherwise we'd all be millionaires and we wouldn't we wouldn't be here right um, yeah, hundred yeah. percent, James. I could I could not agree with that more. I think Matt Lovell would, you know, if if you got him on, he would probably be like, I just sat with him and just I would just ask him question after question. I'm sure he was like, Oh, got to deal with this guy again. <laughs> but <laughs> I was just like, this guy is, you know, at that point he'd worked for England rugby. He, you know, he's been at multiple football clubs, and yes, I'd been at Fulham and run the nutrition program there. So, you know. But I wasn't too proud to be like, what's your opinion on this? What would you do in this scenario? You know, what 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 what's next for you in terms of this? What are you trying to develop? Like, and I just used to pick his brains. But I think you made a really good point. If you just focus on one person, it's their advice. It's what's worked for them. Yeah. You know, potentially they are like pretty kind of open in terms of you know exposing you to different methods and ways and, and means and etc. But I I don't think that you can. Um, place enough value in terms of getting out there and, and having conversations and whatever you want to work in, whether it's female nutrition, whether it's men's health, whether it's people over 40, people doing elite sport, triathlon, endurance, whatever, have conversations with people that are doing different sports, different things, because that is, you, you can always take something from them and apply it to your sport. I think there was, there was a bit of a, a, uh, a bit of a um, kind of fad where people were, a sports club were employing people from like Olympic sports and different sports and putting them into kind of performance director roles within football, within other sports, because they wanted something new. They wanted a fresh set of eyes because you just got a bit stagnant in terms of what people actually offered and what people did. Oh yeah. Well, that's what we've done for 15 years at Mm -hmm. Everton. So we we need something else. And they bring in like a head of swimming and they'd be like, well, the tactics and the methodologies that they used to be pushing people to their absolute limits. Can we, can we kind of distill this down in terms of providing a little bit of advice? And for me, that has been definitely the case in terms of like getting, you know, conversations with people in the medical side of things. So talking to physios, talking to osteopaths, talking to chiropractors and just being like, how do you work? How do you, you know, approach you know client management, you know, in, in a way. And yeah. that was just something that, I took so much away from a guy called Chris Ball. Um, he's an osteopath and uh, he's just the way he worked and used to watch him. And it's just the way that, that he went through his process of treating people was just incredible. And, you know, for me, I always took, I always took stuff away from every time I kind of spoke to him and yeah, you just, you just got to get yourself out there because, and I think this day and age, maybe we don't do it as much but the, the access the accessibility to be able to do that is is endless now you can go on the yeah. podcast you can dm people you can email people you can find their details whereas before it was it was a little bit more challenging so um yeah just don't don't stop like just keep asking that would be my <laughs> biggest piece of advice i guess that's a, what i said to my students as well is is that although linkedin is a platform where you can find people or whatever don't go there with generic can you give me a job you know have a, have a think about and do your homework and and kind of respect the process like you said back in the day if you like you wrote letters i'm sure those letters were were slightly different for each provider or, or they had a bit of a backstory about you and and why you wanted to do what you were doing not just a buy man city give us a job um and, and i don't mean to come across sort of facetious here at all but um i know we hear from lots of practitioners and successful individuals that, that will get hounded on linkedin and, and if you're going to do it and you know you may get a response rate of one percent but just make sure that that person's impressed by what you're you're offering and rather than just kind of just blanket almost ghost mm. ma- mailing people yeah you got you got to stand out nowadays like i think i'm i get a lot of messages from students saying about work experience and you know 
it's hard for me to be offering this because now the business is more remote. So it was a little bit more challenging for me to give something that I think would be of value. But the people that I did respond to, you know, they, they stood out. They gave me a little bit of insight in terms of like, oh, I really love the way you spoke about, you know, that post or the way that your opinion was on that. And I'm like, you've read my content, which makes me think that, okay, you're a little bit more yeah, diligent than someone else that's just gone, all oh, right, well, let's just Google sports nutritionists and then just copy, paste, copy, paste. Okay, yeah, the volume, you might get a few people back. I appreciate that. So well done. But if you can personalize that and just provide something, I think you're going to get a lot further and a lot quicker. This is probably then actually quite a good point to start then talking about when you took that step into PH. Um, but how did you build that business and, you know, develop the client base? And obviously for, for anyone who hasn't heard of PH, go Google them. Um, but because you built, you know, you built a multi-practitioner business that worked across multiple sports and in multiple specialities in a way, you know, you had different mm. practitioners with different specialities within, within your ranks, um, you know, by the, time, by the time we're at this point in time. So how did that, how did you start building that base? So... I was at Spurs and I was like, right, I think, I think I've done my time in football full time. Uh, my progression here is a little bit stunted. So I want to set up something. I was doing CrossFit and I got, I was in the gym that I was in. The, the, the owners were like, we've got a nutritionist upstairs, but she's leaving. There's an opportunity to uh, have a clinic if you would want it. And I kind of, I'm denied. I was like, I've never really done anything. I'm not business savvy. I've worked in football clubs my whole life. I have no business training, but I was just like, ah, oh, do you know what? Like a lot of people, I'm having conversations with people. I do plans obviously for players and everything else. So I was like, I think, you know, and I know I do CrossFit. So I know what people, you know, potential common mistakes, etc. So I was like, yeah, I do one day a week or I did, you know, one day every two weeks, depending on the, on the footy schedule. And it was just something for me that I was like, I didn't really have this desire to be a business owner. I didn't have yeah. this you know, burning thing of like, right, I really want to be like building a, an empire and doing whatever. It was just, for me, something that just kind of happened because I knew I needed that next step. Like I knew I wasn't happy, even though I supported Spurs and even though I grew up a Spurs fan and I was working there every day, I was just like, I can't believe that I'm now here and I want to leave. <laughs> but <laughs> it was one of them where I, I kind of built it a little bit on the side, um, a little bit of a, you know, side hustle these days, which everyone's doing. But I, it kind of snowballed relatively quickly. Remember, I was getting in a CrossFit here we were in the early days. Yeah. And I sat in, I was actually doing a, a Charles Poliquin seminar. And I was sitting next to a guy and Charles Poliquin was talking about business. And uh, this guy turned to me and he was talking about a clientele that he thinks like would make money. And I was just like, nah, mate, it's CrossFit. I was like, anyone that's going to spend 70 quid on a pair of shorts, they're <laughs> going to pay me enough money to help their nutrition. And... But I was doing it anyway. So I got into it and it snowballed relatively quickly. But there was a summer where I was on holiday and I had applied for a part-time job at a couple of clubs as a nutritionist uh, in football clubs and uh, somewhere else in a rehab center. And I di actually didn't get any of them. And I was banking on like, a, you know, two to three days a week at a certain place to cover my rent, and you know, at that point. And then I was like, oh, do you know what? Then I'll build the business on the side. And then none of them come through. And it was that realization. Then I was just like, oh, man, I'm going to have to go back to Spurs full time and do preseason, which if anyone works in football, it's really challenging. It's long days. And I was just it just filled me with like, no, I can't do this. So I rang I rang my boss, uh, the doctor at the time. and was like, oh, I've got to hand my notice in. So I left with nothing. I left with like three, four clients. And I was just like, I, I just couldn't do it. And I was like, well, I've, if I want to do this business, I've got to throw myself into it. So I just, you know, I went into in, into PH and I was just like, right, I'm just going to be around more. So I literally just did what I said at the start and I just put myself in and around gyms and I just spent so much time. Call it luck. I don't know. Timing, whatever. But I went, I was at CrossFit Bold, which is actually isn't um, running anymore. The week after I uh, handed my notice in, Lee Steggles, who actually went to uni, oh, with, okay. uni yeah. with, he opened CrossFit Shapesmiths a week later, and I was living in Ballum. So he was like, oh, come down, mate. And he, and I went down there a week later after I had my notice in, or, or finished at Spurs, and he was like, oh, mate, we've got a room in the back. If you want to, do you want to do the nutrition out of there? 
and I was just like, yeah, go on then. And <laughs> then I, the the other person that was renting the room opposite me was a girl, was a woman called Rosie Scott, and she was running Black Squan Osteopathy, and she was in third space. And I had a converse coffee with her. The oh, first, the first day I met her, she was like, "Oh, we've got a space at um, third space. Do you want to do a nutrition there?" And I was just like, "I was like, yeah, I'm having this." And I like <laughs> the, 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 the week after I left Spurs, I got offered a job, another clinic, and a job at third space. So, you know, it, again, luck, timing, whatever. But you got to, you got to put yourself there. You know, that was the biggest thing that anyone's listening to this and being like, "Oh, it sounds like he's been a bit lucky." Like, I could, I didn't have to go to the open day at Shape Smiths. Do you know what I mean? I didn't have to ask Rosie questions about what she's doing, where else she works, you know, quizzing her on her business. You know, yeah. I, I, if I if I hadn't have done those things, then I, you know, the potential trajectory would have been completely different. So I did that. And then, yeah, it, it snowballed. I, I started getting really busy. I started to get good results, which for me, it, anything that you're doing, social media, you know, anything you think, marketing, advertising, whatever, the biggest thing is just getting results. Genuinely, like we barely did. I didn't really know what I was doing marketing wise, but people would get results and they'd be like, Lynn knows what he's talking about. Do you want to go and you should go and see yeah. him? You know, and it was word of mouth and it was still word of mouth up and right up until the end. Like that yeah. was our biggest thing. We got good results and we did it in a, you know, you know, a nice way, like a, not a, you know, a sleazy way or, you know, a very aggressive kind of manner, which sometimes maybe nutrition is, you know, can be, uh, can be perceived now on social media. And we just, we just snowballed really. And I got in with some, a few influential people. Then I started to be a bit smarter to be like, right, I need to get in with the biggest, the next biggest thing. So I made a beeline to wit when they opened, I knew a couple of the owners and I just hounded them. I was like, I'll run a nutrition there. Let me do it. And I just kept going up there and, and eventually they were like, yeah, we can do it. And yeah, that exposure kind of helped. And yeah. I flew over to Abu Dhabi with another guy and just helped do some blood work with a couple of athletes, Elliot and Jamie. And then they wanted to be my you know, client. So the exposure from them. But, you know, it was all me just kind of thinking, like, just put myself in the arena and, you know, just yeah. be very genuine and be very, you know, helpful to a lot of people. I did a lot of work for free. I coached all of the coaches pretty much at Shape Smith and Bowl for free. Because I was yeah. like, if they're getting good results, then they're going to tell their clients, their PT clients. So, you know, even though I was doing okay in terms of clientele, I was still doing endless amounts of free work. Because I was yeah. just like, I just need to be putting yeah. the name putting the name out there. Did you have um like a formal business plan or, or strategic <laughs> aims? Because no, no. Like, we, we, kind of, we kind of dip into this in that like, course. And, and it's obviously, it's, we're kind of laughing about it, but... Obviously, you've evolved into a, a hugely successful company across multiple different fields. Did you kind of backfill it, if that makes sense? So at the start, no, I didn't have a business plan. You're, you're, you know, you're absolutely right. I, um, I didn't have a, didn't have a mentor. I didn't have a plan. I just was like, I know if I, you know, and this is, not, I hate the word old school because I'm not that old, but like, you know, working, I just worked hard and put myself out there. And I was like, I know that if I can get to a point where I can get busy enough that I can bring someone else on, that's how I'm going to grow. So that was the goal. I was like, at that moment in time, the online space was still growing, but I didn't know enough about it. I knew how to deliver face to face because that's all I'd done in, in football clubs. So I was like, I'll just do that. I'm going to get one coach at Shakespeare. So I'll get another at Bold. I'll open it. I'll get another at Wit. And then I can just you know, be kind of between those so the business plan was very very loose however late further down the line it bit me in the ass a little bit because i didn't have my ducks in a line as soon as i started to grow a little bit maybe kind of two three years in i needed to get data driven and it's one of the things that i talk to a lot of clients about is that if you wing your nutrition in the end you will fail you might get a little bit of results and you might be like, oh, you might see a bit of, you know, weight loss. You might see a bit of progress in your training. But in the end, if you're not being data driven, if you're not tracking something and if you're not working towards a, a, a bit of a you know trajectory, you, you end up you're going to fail. So we ended up trying to get a little bit more data driven, set some targets, you know, what, how many how many clients can we take on per client per coach? You know, what's right. the, the revenue? How much profit are we making? What's our overheads? Where's our, you know, how are we going to grow? And I did get more data driven because 
it removed the emotion as well. When I got data driven, I wasn't emotional with the business. Like it wasn't like, oh, I need, you know, people don't like this or, oh, we've lost these clients. And for me, I, you know, I, I don't wish I would have been data driven from the start because it just wasn't the case that it wasn't needed. But I do think that if you can start to systemize and be a, be aware of, 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 you know, numbers and, you know, attrition rate, retention rate, like lifetime value of clients, all of this type of stuff, then you can, you can accelerate your growth quicker than potentially I could have. So I do think nowadays it is definitely something that I would advise people to be a bit more savvy on from, from the start. When you started getting data driven, was there anything you noticed kind of in the data, whether it be about like retention or attrition that surprised you or that caused you to then change something about the way you were running the business? I just always, I always worked towards creating something that increased the lifetime value of a client. So I was like, we were running like one-off consultations or we were running nutrition coaching. Yeah. And I was like, well, the life average lifetime value of a client was about six weeks or three months. Yeah. So I was like, I've got to resell every time. I was just like, imagine if I could, you know, increase that. And we know with nutrition, people don't necessarily need it 12 months of the year, weekly check-ins, all of this. Like it's, I don't think, I mean, maybe that's me, but I, I don't think that's needed for yeah. 95% of the population. I think some people need it, but I don't think most people need it. So the business model had to change because I was just like, I can't see how I'm going to keep growing because I'm just going to keep bringing on more and more coaches. And then the attrition rate is going to be like, well, what if they go? Then I was like, I needed to build something. So I was always looking at the data to be like, okay, how can we increase that, you know, recurring revenue? So we built an online platform called The Hub, uh, which was like a lower price point. We started to create eBooks. We started to create seminars. We started to create challenges that we would run through gyms that we could then predict, be like, okay, well, we've got, 250 people on the the hub and that's paying 10 pound a month okay well that allows me to put x amount into into in the business for you know other things as opposed to man if we don't sell this many in the six week programs this that's this true. month then we're in trouble so i could then average out how many people we were going to kind of get on the on the programs how many people we had on personalized coaching so it kind of got to a point where i was always looking for something to be able to do that 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 made the recurring revenue it's hard that wasn't easy you know the, the hub worked for a little bit and we put it into gyms and we put it into things but it's you know something that if you're looking at it from you know the students here i would be like i think i was guilty of trying to do too many different things as opposed to focusing on one doing something really good so when you yeah. went onto our website it was like, there's the hub, then there's six weeks, then there's personalized, then there's one off, then there's guides. And I was just like, I look back and think I, I probably could have been a bit more successful if we'd have just offered like one service or two services and give people less choice um, and worked harder on that recurring revenue thing because the reputation brought people through the, the door through in terms door. of personalized coaching. So, you know, I spent a lot of time and effort, I think, in, a, in the areas that maybe I shouldn't do. But again, that's the lesson that I do think that you ha probably have to learn within whatever you know realm you you're going to be offering. You know, you're doing nutrition like you you're going to make mistakes no matter how many mental conversations you have. Like sometimes you have got to make the mistakes yourself to be like, ah, that didn't work. OK, let let's. Let's change and iterate and, and move forward. And look, just I, I realize maybe I'm going on a little bit here about this, but no, this is really the biggest the biggest thing that I found find with successful business owners is not about failure. It's about how quickly they iterate and change. Is to be like, okay, let's try this. That didn't work. Cool. Let's manipulate it slightly and let's try this and let's manipulate it again and let's try this. Oh, that really didn't work. Let's move in the other direction. And it's not so much how many times you fail, it's how quickly you can iterate. And I think that that is, yeah. I mean, potentially looking at March on, like that is something that they do very, very well. They try something, yeah. but they move at such a pace because they fail and then they just, they, they revisit it, they change it, they update it, they tweak it, they improve it, and then they go again. And that was something that we were pretty good at with our coaching at the start. But again, I think I got a little bit lost in the weeds trying to do too many different things. 
I think, especially at the start, just get something that you're really good for and known for and that you can deliver to an incredible standard, then, you know, and just keep making that something that, yeah, you would keep improving. But I think the iteration side of things is definitely something that, <clears throat> you know, you need to not be scared of failing, but just keep iterating and, and moving do forward. You think, um, do you think you learn a lot of that through being in professional sport? Because, you know, the day-to-day working with different individuals and changing managers and different team money and all of that sort of fast paced yeah. evolution, probably put you in a good stead to be going, well, I've had to do this. In, like, I've had given two minutes to do this and now tomorrow's completely different. And, and now we're, yeah. you know, adapting and applying those skills. Yeah, James, you're probably right. Like I hadn't really, I hadn't really thought of that in terms of what, you know, elite sport had taught me necessarily, but with, with uh, elite sport, like you say, the pace that it moves at is incredible and you have to be incredibly adaptable to be in that environment. Like if you're, if you don't move quickly or be able to kind of, you know, take something and, and go like, wow, okay, that didn't work. Let's move on. Or this manager wants this now. Well, okay. My beliefs are this. Let's, let's manipulate it and try and move it forward as best as we possibly can. It's never ideal. Yes, it's an elite sport, but it's never ideal. And I think whatever environment or industry you get into, you're probably, you do look at it from the outside in and being like, oh, that looks amazing. But when you get in there, you're like, oh, well, there's, you know, there's definitely stuff I can affect here and, and improve. But I do think that being that adaptable and not being scared of change was probably something that you know, elite sport taught me because there was so much change. You know, I went through like seven yeah. managers at Fulham, went through a couple of different boss bosses and different heads of department. And, you know, you have to prove yourself again and again and again, and <laughs> you have to be adaptable, which yeah, I think is, is probably something that, you know, I took away from elite sport as well. The, the, the one thing I do think that I, I talk to a lot of students and, and, and kind of younger practitioners about is one thing Mauricio Pochettino always kind of talked about, he was a manager at Spurs I worked under. He he was like, nothing's ever as good as, like nothing was ever amazing and nothing was ever too bad. It was always just we keep moving forward. So like if we won 4-0 on the weekend, it would come in, it'd be like, right, Monday, great. Well done, guys. Fantastic effort. We go again. And, you know, if we lost, he would kind of take that pressure away and be like, look, don't worry. This is something that we need to work on, but we'll do that on Tuesday. We'll do that on Wednesday. Look, we'll get back into it and just, we go again. And it was, it, it kind of gave you a bit of confidence with it. And I, I took that into business to be like, if something doesn't work, I would never got despondent or emotional about it. I was just like, okay, cool. That didn't work. Let's just go again. And I do think that sometimes people can get a little bit like, oh, that's not working. And, you know, Wow, man, I'm I'm not seeing a response from a job, or I'm putting, you know, I'm applying for jobs, or I'm trying to put myself out there and get work experience. Yeah, it's just that relentless drive you've got to have, you know, at the start, and then once you're in, yeah, you you got you got to keep keep your foot on the accelerator. Where where were your sorry, you know, again, where were your kind of um, I don't know if it's phrased correctly, your expectations and reality because. Again, we have lots of students mm. that do so. I, I love the idea of being a consultant or going freelance or have my own company. And the expectation is a lot, you know, just from my anecdotal evidence is that they go, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to start my company and then I'll be good. Um, where is that? Have you got any insights you can share with regards to the expectations of being able to just go, yeah. I'm going to finish my MSc, I'm going to go full time, I'm going to be able to pay my my rent, I'm going to have a good quality of life. And then what the realities may actually look like and anything you might be able to yeah. share regarding that. Yeah, I'm sure Sinead, do you laughing? I'm sure you you experienced the same issues that I, that I had, and you know, feel free to to kind of chime in on this. I think I wasn't young when I started PhD nutrition. I, I was thirty when I started to to, to kind of set it up twenty nine thirty, but I was naive. I did I didn't really know. Like I I none of my my dad had run his own business a little bit, but I hadn't really been exposed to that. So I hadn't been around the people that had done it. So when I first started it, I, I had a little bit of like, oh, I don't really know the pitfalls of it. I was like, I'll just work hard. And I think that because it was mine and setting it up, I didn't mind the hard work. I you know, I worked in insane amount of time, probably too much. I didn't work as smart as I probably could. The reality of it is that when it's yours, you you just don't mind doing the extra work. 
I, I think that's definitely something that a lot of business owners do at the start. I think once you get into it and you start to be like, this is now just a job and I need to earn money and the pressure becomes a little bit more real. I, I do think that the reality isn't necessarily as what social media would kind of, you know, class an entrepreneur or a business owner as like you, you don't get a lot of, you, you can have free time if you want, but my mind was always on the job. Like even when I was with friends or when I was traveling or was on holiday, like I never really switched off and it was something I worked on more recently. Um, but it still was, it was still always there. I found that quite hard if I'm honest, like at certain times, especially when I just started to have like five or six coaches on, like I, I, I found I couldn't have that time away. But again, that was probably me not investing in the right support in terms of mentorship or in terms of support, in terms of how to run a business, you know, and I think I'd have done that earlier. I think I would have been in better, in better shape. I think whatever you want to do is if you want to run a business, if you want to be employed, if you, you want to be a consultant, there's pitfalls to everything. I think that there's, there's good things and bad things. As a consultant, I say this because I've been, I've kind of been all of them, which is, which is actually pretty cool. The consultant side of things, I didn't feel part of the team. That was the hardest mm -hmm. thing. I, I felt I was always on the periphery. I actually didn't like being a consultant. The only, when I was, at, when I was at Copenhagen, the only reason I kind of felt part of the team is because my best mate was the head of performance. So I kind of, got in a little bit easier and felt part of the team but I still didn't really feel part of it you know and that and that was the same as Celtic I didn't really feel you know and, and I love being part of the team you know that that was probably one of the biggest things that I loved about football and maybe one of the biggest drivers in terms of now going into March when I want to be part of something so I do think the consultant side of things is, is what people maybe think is a really attractive because you can you know potentially get a day rate a higher day rate and you can be a bit more flexible with your time but yeah, like if you value that team and being part of something, I probably it's not for you. Running a business is, is relentless, but it's also fantastic. You know, I feel very proud of what I've done. And I do think if you, you know, I'm not saying that everybody should do it, but I do think that it teaches you a lot very, very quickly. And then you can take that into employment. You can take that into any other endeavor that you do. I do. I, so I, it's hard to say, like, do something on the side if, you know, you're not inclined to just setting up your own business. I think that employment is, you know, has obviously has massive benefits. You know, if you can get something straight out of uni, straight out of qualification, I do think then you have the ability to be able to learn from people, you know, in that industry and whether you, you know, take it and go, wow, that was amazing. I learned a lot or go, geez, I don't want to be doing it that way. <laughs> Either way, you, you're going to be, you know, improving the way that you deliver your services. So, what I want to say is I don't think there's a bad path. I just think you've got to be very aware when you're in that to be able to take like, and learn from it, whatever you're, whatever you're doing. So people that maybe go, oh, I should definitely go and run my own business straight out of uni and do this and, you know, build this. If you have that passion and idea, run with it. But if you don't, don't think that you have to do it. Like go and try mm -hmm. and find something that you can learn from people and, and take that pressure away from, you know, building your own kind of empire and just make sure that you're learning from it then being aware of what you can what you can take from it yeah and that's really good advice um and it's that that is that there is no one right path for anyone right and also i feel like particularly in sports nutrition there's rarely a path that someone follows forever either mm. i feel like everyone is very you're going to do more than one thing across the what 50 odd years that we're going to end up working these days yeah, no, no, yeah, me and my, me and my wife were talking about that this morning, actually, pensions and everything. She was like, I was like, no, we can't retire till we're like, I was like, the <laughs> time and age will be about 75, 78 by the time we time we get there. Um, But as you would have seen it, you know, Sinead, like you've, you've run your own business, you've been in certain, you know, employment, now you're teaching, now you're educating. And like you say, I think, I don't, I hate it when people say, what's your five-year plan? I'm like, I don't care about the five-year. Well, tell me what I'm doing yeah. in the next six months. What are you doing in the next six months? That's a more interesting question. For yeah. Me. You know, I'm like, I, that's what I would ask people, like, right, we're out of uni. What are you doing in the next six months? Are you getting educated? Are you, you know, building something? Are you building a product? Are you learning? Are you putting yourself out there, getting work experience, gaining, you know, gaining knowledge or being employed and, again, trying to push yourself 
within whatever you know remit that you're doing and i i do think that the you know i think we spoke about it off air like people maybe want that elite sport type of thing i think if you're dead set on working in an industry right so say you're dead set on working in tennis then it doesn't matter what level you work at people yeah. for me i would look at that and go and like that's sport specific okay as long as you have some sport specific and then you can do anything else around that yeah like and that could be at like club level do you know what I mean like i hosted 15 seminars on nutrition at my local you know tennis club over the last year you know i would be like damn well done like yeah. that would that would be like that you know that person is is being proactive they're formulating their ideas their methodology in terms of how to coach nutrition for tennis so i would i would be interested in terms of what they said even if they were fresh out of uni and that was the first year that they ever did anything i don't care yeah. if you've worked with like elite athletes or got work experience at some academy i was like i was like i, I don't care that i would probably be more interested in someone that's been more self self-starting yeah. yeah that would be the, the thing and and trust me trust me there are always people wanting a nutrition advice whatever yeah. level it is there's people still crying out for it especially just below that kind of more professional level you know it's still crazy like it's still crazy and i'm sure you've seen it in some of the sports you know olympic level people that are very very talented athletes or even like big clubs yeah. big organizations that the support that they're getting is minimal so if you can just pop your head up there and be like look i can do this then yeah. most of the time I think people are going to be grabbing you, you know, well, entertaining and conversation. Whereas like yeah. James, if you said like, if you're just going there going like, you got any jobs? And then <laughs> they'll be like, no. But if you can be like, look, yeah. I've got, a, I've got a five part seminar on how to coach nutrition for tennis. So I had to do, yeah. And I'll be like, right, I'm covering fueling, recovery, immune function, travel, nutrition, you know, supplementation, you know, male, female differences, teens, I'm like, you write that, you invest the time in doing, doing that. That's something that you will always have for the rest of your career. Yeah. But then you go into that person and go, I want to deliver this for you. I'm telling you, most of the time people would be like, yeah, go on then. It's really yeah. powerful that because you get lost. There's still kind of an element of well, what does a nutritionist do out there in the, in the space? Yeah. So you going, like you say, kind of doing your homework and saying, this is what I can provide you is really powerful. And, and it sounds crazy because we're like, hang on, how many people out there are qualified nutritionists SENR and all the rest of it and yet a lot of people don't know what a nutritionist does but actually real opportunity there to, to kind of take ownership of it and and, and show proactivity and, and kind of show from the offset that you are going to kind of be that proactive individual um yeah. which I think yeah. is will hopefully open doors as well um, and, I and I love the point you make about kind of the six months aspect take the pressure off take the pressure off because yeah. especially with social media and all these other things that are going on take the pressure off and just try what well, easier said than done as a dad or two it's not always present but um try to be present try to enable yourself to to use those skills because you know it's not just about having to go down one avenue and and we've discussed a lot through this this, this chat about pivoting and having the ability to do that and everyone in these our cohorts and, and anyone that's done these the snr based qualifications and or other um will have developed like, some of these key skills to to be successful i think mm. yeah yeah I, th I think you're right I, I break it down now into quarters so taking business kind of jargon, but going into applying it to what I'm doing. So like, right, quarter one, what am I doing? And I'm oh, like, yeah. right, th th this is what I'm doing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna deep dive. So I'm deep diving into like glycogen and carbohydrates and endurance. And I'm really upskilling myself on this. Okay. And I'm writing presentations, I'm teaching it, I'm delivering it to, you know, I did a, I did a talk the other day to a group of 50 people. And I, I really, it forced me to really take the information, distill it down. What's my thoughts? How am I going to deliver it? How do I make this very scientific thing into something that people are going to take away and make it more practical and bridging that gap between optimal and practical? That's what I, that's for me, that's what I've always done. Okay. Taking the science, yeah. breaking it down and making it into something that people can go, oh, okay, yeah, that's exactly what I can do this week. You know, like I can apply this into my life right now. And the thing is, is that I, like I said about the tennis example, if you can create something along those lines, that is something you'll have. At, like that is smart work. 
yeah. you know, and that's what something you can do for six months. And I think I, I think people maybe underestimate what they can. I think people overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in a in a week or a day. And yeah. I think you you rather than looking and a year ahead and being like, oh, in a year I want to be X Y Z. Da, 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 go like, okay, well, what can I do in this Q one? Like, what can I do in this next three months? Right, I'm gonna build a presentation or a library of information that is mine, that is unique to me, my thoughts, my philosophies on this topic. Yeah. And I'm guarantee you, then you can just repurpose that into social media. You can purpose that into blogs. You can repurpose that into presentations, talks, education, seminars, booklets, guides, eBooks, whatever it is, but get it down into, I think, writing a presentation. I think it's still something because yeah. if you can teach it and educate it similar to what you you guys do like if, you, if you're teaching it you learn it you know it and and you'll just keep being able to refine that and i think if you take that pressure away of that say that long-term goal of i need to be hitting certain things and just keep moving forward with the short to medium term targets especially when you maybe first come out of uni i do i do i do think that you'll never regret doing that yeah yeah, definitely. Okay. I actually think I used to think um that not having a long term goal was a negative. Um, and that's definitely something that I've actually flipped my mind on. I used to think it's the one thing that I was like, oh, I probably should get some, but uh, whereas now I'm like, ah, oh, nah, definitely not. <laughs> I think it's nice to have an like an umbrella understanding yeah. of like, but not okay, like, I want to yeah. be this. Like, okay, I want you know, it's it, it's like anything. You need to we used to talk about this with clients is like being the person that you want to model so it's like <laughs> modeling the person that you want to be and if you're someone that wants to be you know 10 kilos lighter you've got to model their behaviors you've got to yeah. you know think would a would a person that is 10 kilos lighter than me do this in this scenario no okay well i need to model that behavior would they go to the gym x amount of times would they do this many steps yes so you need to model that and it's the same with the business owner like what would someone be able to do w what would i do in terms of if i wanted to you know run a you know bigger business if i wanted to earn more money if i wanted to be better at my job you've got to be modeling that and i think just having this overarching kind of like umbrella of like okay this is who i would want to be longer term that's cool like i want to be the head of i want to be the yeah. best at but you you're breaking it down in terms of these daily actions weekly actions monthly actions quarterly actions that's the key thing that's the key thing that moves you yeah. forward and as we know it's just simple kind of goal setting and you know, things that you would probably maybe not realize that you're doing with your clients and just applying that it's type of thing to, yeah. to your career and to your progression I do think it's very powerful yeah and then I guess um before I realized we've almost been talking an hour already but um moving then on to the current and the future so then that yeah. decision to you know to kind of transition away from ph and into um yeah full-time into another another business um yeah tell us it's, about that it's exciting <laughs> it's, yeah, it's exciting. exciting the similarly to kind of what you said about james like that the change in within kind of elite sports like the, the business wasn't was was something that i was going to continue to run like i wouldn't have it's not that i'm like oh it's it's failing i want to you know get rid of it like we we were still thriving it was still going well and i still in, you know enjoyed running the business is just the opportunity came up to 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 pivot and to, to do, have a new challenge you know it was too good to turn down i'd had offers over the last few years to go into full-time employment or to do it and it just wasn't right but this one this one was right to give you a bit of backstory i went out full and we developed our own in-house supplement range we were the first club in europe to do it and i was part of the team that, that developed the supplement range we developed everything like greens powders red powders before they became like athletic greens and all of this they were oh, wow. funky as hell but <laughs> they it, it, the, the, we i've got the whole booklet still it's amazing greens powders red powders we had recovery products we had creatine we had beta alanine we had vitamin d chews we had protein vegan protein which was horrible oh, wow. but this was like <laughs> man, what was this been 15 years ago now but we That's developed amazing. the whole thing. So I got to go to the lab. So I got to work with the companies that set it up. So for me, it was something that I'd always had a really keen, keen interest in. So 
I worked with a number number of different companies over the the past few years in terms of developing a product or or sense checking a few different uh, su- supplement products, and I'd always been very interested in terms of developing products. So when Ollie, the owner of March on, reached out to me, we spoke a lot about some digital side of things in terms of an app and nutrition coaching and everything else. But it was a supplement thing that he had set up in COVID that he was looking for some little bit of guidance and uh, advice on, maybe a little bit more authority in terms of rather than just him promoting it uh, and the development of the of the product range. So it now snowballed. So I came on last year around September time, 2023, and, and helped with updating the range. So we updated six of the products. We created a new product called Workout Fuel, which is like a pre-workout kind of with a little bit of carbohydrates in and a few other things. And it's going really, really well. So then that kind of snowballed the maybe the conversations in terms of coming on board full time. So the next the next iteration of my career is going to be developing a supplement range and there's a lot of there's a lot of uh i don't know maybe people think about supplement companies in terms of being a bit just trying to sell your stuff and you know the supplement industry as as a you know as a whole it can be a little bit you know hit and miss in terms of the quality that people kind of get from a from a product maybe the quality information that they get from a product because there's maybe always a hidden agenda of selling something so we just want to be really trusted we want to be providing products that actually fit and support a food first approach so you know we want to be making sure that the supplements that we get it's not going to be a huge range but it's going to be something that plugs the gap that people either yeah. struggle with from a from a food kind of uh, getting in from a food perspective or as your the requirements that you're asking your body to do through training, through life, yeah. through whatever increase, then you potentially need to supplement at certain times to help support that. So it really just about creating products that I would use myself and me and, yeah. and the guys would use and just helping to you know, say spread the world of good, ed- good nutrition education. And as I said, across the, across the business going to be doing a lot more free education around you know, nutrition at different events and social media as well. Still not going to stop doing, putting st- free stuff on there. I think okay. pH was probably one of the the things that people kind of went to for, for good information, similar to yourself. You know, it's yeah, just it's nice just to stick good information out there. Like people always just say to me, like, oh, you, you put too much, give too much away. <laughs> like it's, it, you never can, like you never put good, no. too much good information because in the end, like nutrition coaching is just like, it's about accountability and, helping people yeah. be adhere to the diets like most of the stuff you can find anywhere if you look hard enough it's actually just applying it so i'm not going to be doing any nutrition coaching as such one-to-one coaching with march on it's going to be like I say helping the whole business in terms of improving the uh, nutrition services but yeah the supplement side of things is something that i'm super excited about so that sounds yeah. so interesting and having that end to end as well because you've got like the development of the supplement through to then actually helping people use it in the right way that's exactly that's it. really interesting yeah the, the the science side of things and form you know, formulations is still incredible to me i, I love it I, lo- I love you know yeah. i love to going down to the lab when i was at fulham i loved being involved in those conversations and you know again it's something that i'm, I'm just it's just passionate about you know and it's something that i really Absolutely. feel that you know there's a few products that we've got out there that i think you know potentially can, can manipulate a you know, and make really useful for people rather than just uh, bulk powders with eighty percent off. I'll stock up. Like these are yeah. going to be targeted, <laughs> targeted for people, and but educating them in in the correct way to just be Easy. using them at the, the the right times rather than being like, oh, I'll just stock up because me mate did it. So that's really really interesting. That. I do feel like there's like a little bit of a shift in the supplement in that there is a growing element of, in the supplement industry or new companies in the supplement industry with that definitely ethical ethos, if you like, you know, with definitely. that client-centric ethos. Because like Marshall, it sounds like they've got a similar vision. If you look at, you know, new, newer companies like um, Fair Performance Nutrition, et cetera, it is more centred around yeah. the client rather than just the profit. Obviously, you've got to make money as a business, but I, I like this shift. <laughs> A hundred percent. You know, the, the supplement chat is probably another another podcast, but people are going to supplement. People, yeah. th- this is what I'm saying. People will buy stuff, you know, regardless if, if I'm there or not. I want to just make sure that people are using their money in the correct way. They're getting the right yeah. things that they need and creating products that 
actually do something for you as opposed to being like are you actually deficient in this in this new you know these nutrients so do you need a multivit do you need a pre-workout yeah. do you need you know a protein do you need these things and actually you know it's helping the the consumer to be able to make that informed choice but you're right i do think that and it's really nice to see that there are it, it, there is a rise of these companies that are are plugging the gap for people whether that's through yeah. greens powders whether that's through uh, products to you know adaptogenic products and nootropic products to help people with the kind of modern day stresses of life such as you know james as you know parenting is challenging sleep de deprivation stress you know people are doing more and more like volume of training and intensity of training with like hybrid training and ironman and you know and crossfit and all of these types of things and i'm like okay from a food first point of view i think sometimes when we push into these amounts and this is general everyday people are doing it yeah. i think it's challenging i think it's challenging to do it for my food but a food only approach so if you can have something that plugs the gap really nicely you know that's where hopefully we can we can come into it but i do think there's some fantastic products out there and we're definitely not looking to you know step on the toes of other people and, and other companies and do everything. But we, we do definitely want to affect your training. Like that is a big part of what we want to yeah. do. Um, and yeah, it is a, it'd be a nice, to, it'd be a nice one to um, have a 15 minute hot topic on this as well. We can get, if we can get you back on in mm, when you've started, so. have, we, yeah. would it be really nice to go so I'm really focused on, on the new role in the new supplement range. Cause that's kind of uh, be nice to see kind of that evolution. And I, I guess just, uh, it'd be really interesting I think another podcast for some of the uh, discussions you had around the full and make your own supplement brand. That must have been, you've got, you've got some stories to share there as well. <laughs> I have. Oh, mate, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you one. There was like, we used to have this, the green, one of the things I did when I first kind of fully took over, we had this greens powder and then we had this reds powder. And the greens powder, honestly, was the the rankest thing ever it was like <laughs> and then what we tried the, what the guy tried to do was just put more and more peppermint flavor into it <laughs> to kind of mask it and i was just, we were like drinking and the lads were drinking this and it was my job i was like i'm like my job to try and get the boys to drink this and every day i was battling with them every day i was like oh come on lads you gotta be taking this you gotta be doing this because we got 50 tubs in the cover there so we gotta get rid of it um, we actually mixed the reds and the greens together. I actually mixed it together to make a purple drink. And um, nowadays, oh, like you say, the, these the, these <laughs> greens drinks, that's the best greens. They've got yeah, antioxidant yeah. antioxidant blend. They've got a you know a, a you know a kind of green blend. Curve. I was well ahead of the curve. I could have been. <laughs> yeah, I say, I do think. Look back, me and my bo my old boss Mark Taylor. We look back and and be like, man, we should have just like run with a supplement company and put it into football clubs and. And done whatever it was sitting there. It's fine. We we had some wicked products out there. You know, we had one. We had actually had like a, a an adaptogenic product, Calm Down, that we used for night games. So, oh wow! Yeah, phosphatidyl, uh, serine, phosphatidylcholine. We had uh, ashwagandha. Um, God, the other wow. one it escapes my mind. But I mean, that was ages ago. Like I just yeah, think, well, well ahead of the curve. Yeah. Yeah, we was. I was like, like man, like this it. is so good. Yeah. yeah so good but, that, that, um, they have that kind of flexibility in a professional environment of what prem were they prem at the time or, or yeah, championship we were prem. Yeah. no we were prem yeah you've got, you've i got jumped ship i jumped ship james when we re relegated <laughs> yeah. i went to spurs we got relegated i jumped <laughs> <laughs> i was straight out the door <laughs> um, but yeah it was it was incredible like uh, uh, again getting in front of uh, we talk about mentors to loop back and, and kind of wrap things up is that i got the right mentors so they were they were they were incredible at pushing me they were incredible at allowing a little bit of space for kind of my ideas and it was it was it was a team it was a team effort creating those supplement products so um it it was amazing because we had we had a bit of you know we obviously we had a budget which was which was great and yeah it was it was bouncing ideas off of of everyone and being around that so you say it, it was it was an amazing time i look back with so much i so much like joy at, at my time at fulham it was it was so it was so nice it was probably my say thing that really kind of catapulted me in terms of becoming a, a little bit more confident in my knowledge and a little bit more confident in delivery and, and what i do but um but yeah 
I think lots, um, of, lots of stories to tell on on the yeah. on the Fulham Fulham side. <laughs> We've come to, I come to just a, a time in your time because uh, this is your kind of couple of weeks off. But um, I think something from my end that's been really powerful throughout this chat is that it kind of seems to be throughout all of your roles and every, even the new direction you're going in that the importance of people and connection seems to be kind of ever present. Um, and I think it's really important for the listener to kind of take on, you know, the importance of mentors, unofficial or, or official, or those people that are just influential or enabling you to to thrive and to ask the questions and be proactive and be inquisitive and all those sorts of things seems to have played a really important role in your career to date. And um, yeah, just just from my end as well, Liam, having only met you once, I've, I've really enjoyed the chat and I really appreciate your uh, openness and honesty and to do this obviously free of charge and and uh, hopefully I, I know everyone will get loads from this. So yeah, all the best in, in the new role for sure. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you, Liam. Yeah, very, very kind <laughs> words. Like you say, I hope, hope people have taken something away from it. I think with all podcasts, it's going through and, and trying to really kind of be aware and listen to like what you can apply straight away to you because often the case yeah. is there's lots going on. But if you can take something away, like you say, just get out there, ask questions. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. But like you say, you'll... Uh, yeah, whatever, whatever prepare, pathway you choose. Prepare yourself for a hundred letters in the, the door. In the <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah, that is it. I love a letter. I love yeah, we can oh, someone send me a letter. That we can know everything about it. So, look, that, if someone sent me a letter, I'd be like, they've definitely listened to the podcast and taken, like, take, take, taking this advice on. And I, I would probably give them a call or, or a letter back, definitely. But yeah, guys, thank you so much for, for, for bringing me on. Like you say, this is, I, I think it's so important to, you know, be able to have, people come on and talk about their experiences because I, I think I would have loved it, absolutely loved it when I was a I was a student. And I still love it now. I still listen to people like you say and listen to their experiences. So yeah. yes, thank you so much for inviting me on. It's been a it's been a pleasure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.